So I think we're getting ready to go. We are going live. Thank y'all for joining in today. And as we get ready to go live, can someone check our Pine Hills Community Council page and make sure that we are on the Pine Hills Community Council page? I think you are, it's there. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Why, why am I getting an echo? Okay. No, that was me checking to see if you were on Facebook. Okay, thank you. So we are, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, thank you. It is a few more minutes. We're not quite 6.30. I think the clock just turned to 6.30 and our folks are still signing in. I thank you all again for joining in on the Pine Hills Community Council today. This is our monthly community meeting. I'm Patricia Rump and I am your president of the Pine Hills Community Council. We're gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order. It is exactly 6.30 that we're calling the meeting to order. We'll open up with prayer with Pastor Joey, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led in by Pastor Joey, and then we'll get into our meeting. Pastor Joey, please. He is our second vice president, Pastor Joey. Let me do one more thing. If you're uh, here with us live, you'll please put your phone on mute if you're not speaking. Thank you very much. Pastor Joey, the prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance, please. All right. Well, Lord, we thank you for being so great and so mighty and so awesome. And we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to come in and discuss the things of this uh, community and putting things to action. And we thank you for uh, everyone that's on uh, that, that their input and everyone that's part of the council and, and all of the, uh, the police and representatives and just everyone that's something God we thank you God for what you're doing in this community and Lord we just pray God that in this meeting God that we would be led by you and everything that we do in Jesus name amen amen, amen. Um, <clears throat> let's salute to the flag is it right yes okay good yes. the other way uh, I pledge allegiance yes. to, the to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, States of America. Yes. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible liberty, liberty, and justice. And justice for all. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're able to share, go on your Facebook page and share what the council is doing. So everyone could be involved and understand what the Pine Hills Council is doing. Again, I am Patricia Rump, your president of the Pine Hills Community Council. We have several of our board members with us today. Our second vice president, Pastor Joey is here. We have uh, uh, Bettina Bush, our secretary. We have our treasurer, Ms. Van. We have our board members, Dr. Nichols. We have um, Dr. Uh, Itler here with us today. We have Joey. Um, John, John Anthony Williams here with us today. And we have Ken, another board member here with us today. Did I get all the board members? Let's see if you can turn page. Is there anyone here that I missed as far as a board member? Okay. Again, thank you for those that's tuning in live. Thanks for being here. And for those that are watched on Facebook, thanks for joining us here on Facebook. Again, the Pine Hills Community Council is a 501c4 nonprofit organization. We are nonpartisan. We're a civic organization. We're here to express the need and the interest for those that's in the Pine Hills area. We are uh, uh, well respected on the local, state, and federal level of government. And we're primarily your everyday working people, just like you, your bus drivers, your restaurant workers, your doctors, your lawyers, your judges, your retirees, and your uh, legislators, and your business owners but we're here to invest in, in uh, for the interest of the area of Pine Hills. Again, thank you for joining us and come back again. Please join us. <laughs> so I'm going to, I, I need a, uh, everyone to please mute your phone if, if you're not on. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off with the agenda. Let's see if I can share a screen here. Get started with the meeting here. So again, please keep your phones, microphone muted if you're not speaking. 
and the order of business here is if I get this thing going. That's not what I want. So I can turn this page. I've been fooling this all day long. You think I would have it by now? Okay, let's just get out of here. So the order of business here, we're going to do the approval of the minutes. I sent out the minutes uh, earlier to the board, to the uh, council member. So if you are a Pine Hills Community Council member, you should have received a copy of the minutes. And if you receive the copy of the minutes, can we get someone to, if you had opportunity to review the minutes, make a motion to accept the minutes or make any corrections from the minutes? I move that the minutes be accepted as printed. I second. Thank you. It's been moved by Ms. Richardson and second by Ms. Fatney Hall. Is there any questions? No questions or discussion. So the move of, uh, the minutes are approved. The treasury report. Let me see if I can put the treasury report here. That's not what I want. I'm gonna go back to share screen. I got the treasury report someplace. I thought I did. Yeah, you showed it a minute ago. I did, didn't I? Mm -hmm. I tried to fool with this thing all the day. You would think I would have this down by now, but mm -hmm. <laughs> you play with it too much. And that's what happened, huh? Let's see, share screen. That's not what I want either. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> ah, give me a break. Let's, let's try this. One more time, good people. This is it right here. Let's oh, let's open this up. I'm pulling up the minutes if this thing will allow me to. I'm sure it will, but okay. I have it on the screen, so I'm gonna um the one minute get out of here. Can you see that? Nope. Let's just about to share screen. Share screen. Can you can you see the minutes now? Yes. I mean the uh treasury report now. Yes. Is this is that the right one, Ms. Van? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you. So, so good afternoon, everyone. What we have before you is the minutes for the month of June. Treasury you, report. My mistake. <laughs> for the month of June, uh, as you can see, that we had an income of ninety six dollars and fifty cents for the month of June. We have a expense of nineteen dollars and seventeen cents for the month of June, and that was for our domain GoDaddy. And so with that in mind, at the beginning of June, we had $3,613.57 in the treasure. Our income was $96.50. Our expense was $19.17, which leave us a balance of $3,690 in our checking account. In our savings account, uh, we had $1,625.30. We got our whopping one cents increase uh, interest. And so we got 1625.31. And then in our, our separate um, savings account at Sunbank, we have $7,783.43. And we received a seven cents um, interest. And so our total is $7,783.50. When you combine our two savings account and our uh, checking account, the total that we have on hand is $13,000. $99.71. Are there any questions? I have none. Okay, if not, I turn it back over to the uh, president to finish. Okay, so the uh, the treasury report is approved as presented. Thank you, Ms. Vance. She, she does a great job doing her treasury report. Thank you so much and thank you, Bettina does a great job in her uh, uh, secretary recording. So we're gonna move through the agenda. And I was hoping I would have this agenda here, this thing, but oh, there we go. I knew I did this today. It's a matter of figuring this out. That was agenda. We did the, um, one more thing here. We, we did the, uh, hold on for a second. Sorry about that, good people. I'm gonna get this right in a minute. There we go. We had the call to order, the welcome, approval of the minutes, the treasury report. So now we, we're with the president report. And the president report is going to be uh, pretty brief. 
because we have three guest speakers here today and we want to get, uh, get opportunity to give our guest speaker that time that we allowed them to bring the update from the state legislator. So with our president report, I want to bring an update about our in-person meeting. Uh, we, still have, we still have not received approval to go back and do in-person meeting at nighttime. The county has not opened up the building to us at night. Normally we would meet at the Pine Hills Community Center and our meeting used to held at the center, which is a county, county facility at 6.30. So that has not been opened up to us. So from this point forward, until I hear anything different, we will continue to have our virtual meeting. So that's what the update is for us in person meeting. The uh, five five we had talked about the location on Powers Drive, the five five nine zero Powers Powers Place retail facility that's open up a, a business with several outlets in that business, and one of the outlets in that business was a liquor store, and uh, I received word from uh, Commissioner Moore's office, which this business will be located in District Two, that the liquor license has been approved even though we fought diligently against that, but well, there's a liquor store to come in our area, but that has been approved. Other thing I want to mention is that we also was working on this, uh, a little ordinance with, with Orange County. We know that uh, in 2012 and 2008 and 2012 with the um, subprime and lending, Pine Hills Community Council suffered this type of litter abuse with household items being placed on the curb. So we put together a, 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 a presentation. I went to the Board of County Commissioner meeting. Prior to going to the Board of County Commissioner meeting, I spoke with a, a real estate attorney. I spoke with property owners. I spoke with landlords. I spoke with apartment complex manager as to how we can resolve this litter abuse in the Pine Hills area of putting out household items. Did the PowerPoint presentation at the Board of County Commission meeting. And from that presentation, this is part of the presentation. From this presentation, uh, Orange County has reached back out to us and uh, let us know that uh, what we propose, let me backtrack, what we propose is that the ordinance, the Orange County order, little ordinance on the book, be modified in such a way that says when there is an eviction and a large household items trash out, that that landlord would notify solid waste in writing of the household item that would be set outside. So solid will give them a notice. The notice will be notified the landlord or the person that's doing the eviction we notify solid waste once that property owner has received the writ of eviction and writ of possession from the sheriff's office said you can take up ownership of that property. So we're saying in 48 hours after that landlord received writ of possession, I am, I'm, I'm gonna mute a couple of lines here saying Brit of possession that uh, that landlord notifies solid waste of what's going on. So solid waste will have a heads up and be able to go back and pick up this, these items and not let these items sit on the curb sometime weeks and almost a month. The good news is, like I said, once we did this presentation to the Board of County Commissioners, the uh, solid waste department and neighborhood services has been meeting about how they can rectify this problem and not let this abuse of litter sit in the, on the curve for uh, more than a day or two days. And they've been meeting and has been uh, looking to meet with the Orange County legal staff. And so things are moving forward. And I'm glad to hear about that. So if there are any questions about what we presented to the Board of County Commissioners? No. So that was that. The other thing is one quick announcement. We talked about this earlier. There is a meeting coming up. I'll make this couple of announcements. There is a meeting coming up. If you've been following Orange County government, they've been having several webinars about 2050 vision plan. 
as to how they're going to change the orange code throughout Orange County and to uh, 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 what their plans for, for 2050. And so now they're, Orange County is breaking out in different communities. I was saying earlier, I went to one in Lockhart today and the Pine Hills will be hosting their breakout section on the July the 26th, 27th, and 28th. It will focus on Pine Hills Road from Silver Star going south to Colonial. That's really District 6. They will focus on how we want to, how they plan on developing that Pine Hills Road. It's very important that you in turn, that you try to attend all the workshops to understand what's going on. The 26th will be a workshop. What I gather from going to Lockhart uh, event is that the 26th, the first one would be, we would go and present our ideas to the planners of, of Orange County. They will present their ideas. And we as a resident will say, yeah or nay, well, let's just make some changes. We will, we will submit their changes to them. And then the 27th will be a, a uh, like a walkthrough. The 27th will be held, like you see, at the Experience Church. It'll be from 10 to 4. And during that time, 10 to 4, what I experienced at Lockhart today, you walk in at your own time and own pace. Orange County planners are there. They will uh, have a map of the area that they're focusing on. And you can continue to communicate with them, get better understanding of uh, what you presented on the day before, that Monday. And then that Wednesday, 28th, we come back together again at uh, uh, Barnett Park. And what we came up with on the 26th, the planners will have it presented and ready to have it on the maps for us on the 28th. So it's very important that we participate in all these workshops, the 26th, 27th, 28th. If you're anything like me, I like to know what's going on in my community and I wanna be a part and give my input in the community. Quick note, we need to register. You can say, you see here says due to limited capacity, pre-registration is required. So uh, please go here. This information will be on our Facebook account. This information will be on our website. Uh, if you need the flyer, uh, put in the text or email us at info at pinehills.info and I will send the information to you. This is our email address. If you need the information, send it to info at pinehills.info. I will send you the flyer for more information. Well, please, people, let's stay engaged. Like the young folks say, let's stay woke. So that's my update for the president before. Are there any questions? No questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and go back. We're gonna have, um, we on time, we're gonna have two committee updates, one with our sheriff department and one with Dr. Nichols. On, she's going, Dr. Nichols is gonna talk about our event that's coming up on July the 24th. So we have Deputy Mark Davis with us with the sheriff department here today. Deputy Davis, it's, it's on you. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me join your meeting. Uh, I'm stepping in for Captain Ela uh, as he's out and away, and he has given me the overview report of um, crime data, a year to date comparison from 2020 to this year, 2021. Uh, when it comes to homicides, we are down 50%. Robberies, we are down 44%. Persons crimes, we are down 8%. Sex crimes, we are down 39%. Auto theft, we are down 29%. Residential burglaries, we are down 25%. Commercial burglaries, we are down 32%. And auto burglaries, we are down 44%. So overall, the total of all crimes combined comparison of 2020 to 2021 year to date is down 31%. And now I'm open for any questions you might have. Any questions? Um, Anybody? What person's crime was down how much? I'm sorry, which one? Person's crime. 
Parsons crimes are down. Oh. <laughs> Give me a moment. I just lost my sheet. Uh -huh. uh, let me go find that again. So I have a question, but I'm not sure if this is your, yeah, that's your area. That was an okay. incident. That was, go ahead and, and, uh, and, and ask uh, Ms. Cloud a question, I'm sorry. Personal crime, go ahead, my mistake. Uh, Debbie, go ahead and answer Ms. Cloud questions. Okay, here we go. Uh, the person's crimes are down 8%. Okay, thank you. Yes. You're very welcome. There was an incident that occurred that occurred a couple of weeks ago. About I think the guy name was Benjamin, a young guy that was found shot over by Molly Ray Elementary School. Are you familiar with that? Uh, that I am not. Um, do you have? Um, did you have the approximate date? You said about three weeks ago. If that long, it wasn't quite three weeks ago. He was found shot in his car on Indi India Atlantic and Kingsland. Okay, I recall hearing that on the news. I, I'm not privy to the case, um, so I don't have any available updates on that. Okay, 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 okay. Unfortunately. Okay, no problem. Madam Rump, I did have my hand up. Yes, ma'am, um, thank you. I had a question for Deputy Mark, I just basically clarification and also with this data because we've been as a council speaking about talking points and specifically about crime okay. um, in our area as compared to other areas and we know and we're hearing month after month um, when you all come on that crime is going down in our in our community in Pine Hills however there's still the negative perception is that it is higher than or more than um, so my question is, is, is there a way to obtain this specific data that you're referring to mm -hmm. so that possibly we can begin to start developing our talking points related to crime specifically? Uh, the information that they had passed to me is, um, it's basically titled a Pine Hills Overview Report, and I'm assuming that it's run based on uh, the zip code. And with that, that report is put together by our crime analysis unit. Um, and they, they, of course, put a, uh, a, a disclaimer down at the bottom that says the accuracy of this information is based solely on the reports received by the crime analysis unit during the specified crime periods. Um, this, uh, this does not reflect on um, the UCR reporting. I believe that that's when they go into uh, greater detail to um, uh, verify uh, crimes. So in other words, what I mean by that is, let's take for example, a robbery uh, initially, a call can come in as a robbery, uh, but after the deputy does an investigation on the crime, it can actually turn into a petty theft or it can become a, a felony theft or something along that line. But it, it changes its classification, and that shows the difference between what we report under our crime analysis and our UCR reporting. Um, as far as doing a comparison between uh, zip codes, uh, so if I understand your your question correctly, um, were you looking to do a comparison, say, between Pine Hills and Dr. Phillips? Well, I, I I'm not. That's something that we can discuss. I mean, this might not be the forum for this at this point. But just okay. basically, that's something that we would be looking to obtain um, sure. to, to develop our talking points. And possibly, I mean, apples to apples sometimes. Um, again, uh, apples and oranges might not be something that we can, can possibly look at. But yes, we will touch bases. Can you just put your information? I think that Patricia already has it in the chat so that that way we can reach out and go further with this. Absolutely. Question and tweet. Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. If you don't have any more questions, we're going to move on to 
Dr. Nichols' report, because I do want to get to the legislative update and, and a decent time to give the representative time to uh, present the legislative update. So Dr. Nichols, you could just tell us briefly about the uh, our event that's coming on July 24th, please. Absolutely. Thank you for allowing me to share the information, but we are so excited as a council to partner with Barnett Park and Recreation Center uh, to actually clean up um, as part of our initiative for July with the waterways cleanup is to look at the Pine Hills Community Trail. And there are three ponds at the Barnett Park that have been identified. So that's going to be our primary goal as we begin the work on July 24th. It's a Saturday, please come out. Um, there is information to sign up on the council's website, and we need every volunteer, every organization, association, church, et cetera, to come out and join us on Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. until 11.30 a.m. So we are, you can come out, you can jog, you can walk, you can skate, whatever it may be, because we are going to be cleaning up along the Pine Hills uh, community trail as well as the park itself and looking at those three specific ponds. So this uh, venture is a um, opportunity for all to get involved and get come out and get some fresh air, uh, walk with your friends, your community, your associations and work towards the cleanup, that's our goal. So there's the flyer. And I believe that I'm going to try to, to I believe it can be shared. I would have to see if we can get, uh, uh, attach it a document here, but it is on the council's website, Pine Hills Community Council's website. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. It's, it's on our website and also on our Facebook page. Absolutely. So let's come on, come on out and do our part and clean up a lake. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Please share your uh, this information now. And while you're here, thank you for joining again and, and share this uh, uh, this uh, meeting they're going on to uh, everyone so they'll be able to know what's going on in our legislature as well as our community so we're we're right on time i want to be able to give the legislative time to come in and give us an update i think they all have signed in and, and thank you very much for those for them that uh that did sign in i'm gonna put this up one more time Let me go here do this and give a brief here we go I'm gonna introduce our speakers. And then after I introduce the speakers, we'll start with uh, Senator Bracey, the Representative Brown, the Representative McCurdy. So we will take questions and answer at the end of the, end of all, after all three have spoken, we will answer questions at that point so that we don't delay the time between each one is speaking did we stop asking questions? No, we're going to ask questions at the very end. So as they are speaking, please write your questions down to you so we have them ready at the end of their presentation. So I'm going to do a brief, a brief introduction of all three. Then after that, we will get started. So Senator Bracey is a Senator of Florida, Florida Senator Randall Bracey. And he is a graduate of Co the College of William & Mary. He has a master's degree from University of Central Florida. He has been a senator since he started in the legislature uh, quite some time ago, but he's been a senator. No, he started in 2012, serving his four year term as a state representative for the House District 45. In 2016, he successfully ran for state senator for the 11th district and became the first African American in history of the state of Florida to be appointed chief of the criminal justice committee. He, with his tenure as a chair in 2018, he is now serving as vice chair on selected committees on the pandemic preparedness and response and is a member of the appropriation rules and transportation, ethic and election and Appropriation Subcommittee on Criminal Justice and Civil Justice. This is Senator Randolph Bracey. We have Representative Camille Brown. Representative Camille Brown is a native of Atlanta, Florida. 
And I've been knowing Representative uh, Brown since before she started, probably started first grade or kindergarten. I'm a native and she's a native and her parents uh, are native. And she has been uh, doing this type of work for over 13 years. She started, she began her career as an intern, as a legislative aide over 13 years ago. Today, Representative Brown is a House Democratic leader. She is the vice chair of the Florida Legislative Black Caucus. She served on several committees. She received her bachelor's degree in political science and concentration in public administration from FAMU. I guess she couldn't get in UCF. So. <laughs> That's my school, of course you know that by now. And she was uh, received recognitions from the uh, uh, Florida Professional Firefighters Association for being legislative aide of the year, Representative Camille Brown. And then we also have Representative Tavares McCurdy. Tavares McCurdy was born and raised in District 46 where, where, where he serves. He also attended FAMU University, has a bachelor's degree in political science. He is the former chief legislative aide to Senator Jer uh, Geraldine Thompson and State Senator Randall Bracey. He's a former deputy, he served also formerly as the deputy political director for the National Super PAC for our futures as well as Florida civic engagement and coordinator for the NAACP. On November 17, 2020, uh, McCurdy was sworn in as representing District 46 in the Florida House of Representatives which includes parts of Orange County. And a representing um, McCurdy plans to focus on the needs of the community in the areas of housing, criminal justice, reform, education, senior citizens, and economic in this Florida legislator. Let us welcome here today with us, Senator Randall Bracey, Representative Camille Brown, and Representative Thomas McCurdy. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for taking this time out. We're gonna give the floor to, first off, the Senator Randolph Bracey. Senator Bracey is on. Thank you, Patricia Rump. I appreciate it and everyone that's on this call. Um, I'm not sure how you wanted to uh, present it, but I, I'll just, I'll get us started. Um, this, this legislative session was very interesting to say the least. There was uh, quite a number of things that got a lot of attention that uh, I did not support as well as uh, the two representatives, Representative Brown, Representative McCurdy, which we did not support, the anti-protest bill. The anti Excuse yes. me, thank you, thank you. Let's do, we are right at 7.05. If we do 10 minutes each, say five to, five to 10, seven to 10 minutes each, and put us right at 7.35, then we could go into question and answer. Okay. 10 well, minutes, okay. I, well, let me, I'll just focus on criminal justice right now, because I didn't know if you want us to go to our individual uh, bills that we both, we all worked on, but the way the agenda, has it we'll, we'll focus on just the larger topics and so okay. I'll focus on criminal justice okay and then I'll let them talk and then we can talk about our individual bills so okay thank you uh, just yeah so just to look at um criminal justice this is something that I've fought for in this space for years since I've been elected and so we had a number of bills that uh that I've focused on uh, marijuana expunctions. Uh, we passed that through the uh, through the Senate. Um, uh, uh, some of the other things that we always talk about, um, but what what really did pass that that, that I was really proud of is a police reform package, and this is uh, a bill that I sponsored in the Senate, worked with the House leaders uh, to pass, and so it's unprecedented to see a bill like this. And so I think this is probably the main thing, uh, criminal justice wise that did pass that I'm extremely proud of. I'll just talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, when it when you talk about 
training. So it requires all law enforcement training to develop policy, all law enforcement agencies to develop policies on use of force. This includes the escalation techniques, it, proportional use of force. It bans chokeholds only unless uh, the officer is under the threat of death or bodily harm. It requires the duty to intervene. Uh, we saw what happened with George Floyd where the other officers were watching. Now every police unit in the state has to be trained on the duty to intervene. Um, they have to be trained on recognizing and responding to persons with substance abuse or mental illness. It requires independent investigations. Um, if there is an officer involved shooting, um, it requires, it requires uh, law enforcement agencies to report to FDLE on a quarterly basis, all use of force incidences that result in serious bodily injury or death. And finally, it, it institutes the Cairo Act. This was a bill that I sponsored dealing with Cairo, who is this six-year-old girl who was arrested. Oh, yeah. Because of that, now we, we instituted that in this police reform package. And now uh, no child under seven can be arrested. Very and good. so, yeah, so th this was a, an accomplishment. I sponsored in the Senate, many, many members of the Black Caucus worked on it, also in the House. And so uh, when we talk about criminal justice, I think this is probably the, the main accomplishment that we, we all are proud to have sponsored, I mean, to, to have passed. And then uh, just to stay in the, the vein of criminal justice, um, there was the church carry, uh, a concealed carry bill that did pass that, that I was not supportive of, but it gives religious institutions broad powers to allow individuals to carry concealed weapons on their property, regardless of whether the space is owned, leased or being used at the time for that purpose. Uh, so it, the bill supersedes any uh, concealed carry laws. And so it, it expands uh, open carry laws, basically. Um, and then obviously there's the anti-protest legislation. We can get into that a little bit later, but it, it really uh, hampers people's free speech and, the, and their ability to protest injustice. And so I think it was directly um, in response to the, the protests that we saw last summer and, and the governor trying to make a statement uh, against those protests. So uh, I'll leave it there just because I know we're limited on time. I'll let my colleagues speak and, and then we can talk about some of the in other individual bills that we work on. Okay, so who's up next? Yeah, so I'll, uh, and I'll piggyback with just the anti-protest uh, bill. I would suggest your organization, but many of the organizations that are on here, including our churches, uh, to definitely get with Allison, who is with Equal Ground, uh, who has, because uh, we don't have enough time to break, you know, that bill down, but it's very important that we educate the community um, on that bill so that we know, um, you know, how we should govern ourselves, but also prepare ourselves in case there are some issues uh, here within our community. Um, and I'll just go, uh, you know, just real quickly with the civil liability bill. Uh, that was also a bill uh, that was a huge bill that we started off the legislative session with. Uh, and pretty much that, that bill, the civil uh, liability bill, uh, basically provided immunity for organizations, uh, for businesses, for educational institutions, for religious institutions. So if they put forth a good faith effort uh, of you know, practicing COVID guidelines, uh, whether that's just a sign because there is no definition of a good faith effort, uh, if they were to do something even just simply as a sign, but not even cleanse, they would be immune um, from being sued by a particular person. Now with that bill, it, it does not include, like I, I mentioned those that it include, it does not include our hospitals, our nursing homes, our assistant living facilities, or any other healthcare related uh, facility as it relates to protecting from COVID-19. Um, and also okay. that bill provided a one year statute of limitation for you to uh, put in a claim on whatever entity. Um, 
some of the other bills that we dealt with, which was uh, uh, a work for, workforce bill, uh, which created a new office up under uh, the governor to, uh, or up under a DEO, but it would allow them, it would require them to really address the needs that we have here uh, within our labor, labor market. And so it would actually have them uh, create reports, uh, establish new grant programs, new trainings, require um, our school boards and our state uh, college systems institutions to create a money back guarantee, which would refund folks, um, graduates, their tuition if they were unsuccessful in finding employment. Really? Uh, yeah. And so, you know, that information will be on the DEO website, uh, but they are, that was one of the sort of big priorities of uh, a part of the, the, the speaker's blueprint. Uh, that was a big bill uh, located he, um, in our legislature. And, uh, you know, feel free if any of my other colleagues want to just kind of provide uh, any additives uh, to what I'm kind of talking about, if they have a different perspective. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it also, we worked on creating additional programs and trainings and learning opportunities for many of our workforce, but also many of our students within uh, our high schools. Uh, uh, so yeah, so uh, well, it would also allow them to create digital credentials and uh, career readiness as well. Career readiness. Rep, Rep McCurdy. All right, I think this is a good time for me to jump in because I served on three education committees yep. um, in the House in Tallahassee this past session. So, um, but I do want to um, just give my two cents on the HB1 anti protest bill because a lot of folks are uh, aware that there are some lawsuits going on with ACLU. And of course, this is, a, this is a, the, the bill is an incredible overreach of authority, but just because uh, there are lawsuits in court right now, it, it is still the law of the land here in the state of Florida. So if you're out there protesting, I know today there's some folks protesting on Cimarron, you know, um, but if you're protesting, just be mindful of, and, and like Representative Brown said, um, there are um, representatives with equal ground tonight who can better educate you, um, and, you know, more in depth. But just to, and, and this to go back to the education, I'll just highlight some of the larger bills that uh, made it to the floor and um, our, um, eventually got signed by the governor. So HB3, um, House Bill 3, was a home book delivery for elementary students um, program. That'll be a statewide initiative. Um, it'll cre uh, create the New World Reading Initiative to provide at-home literacy uh, support for elementary school students um, that are reading below grade level. So. Uh, Representative Brown and I actually, we worked together um, for a different organization where we were helping um, identify children um, that received level ones and twos on their uh, statewide exam for FSA scores um, and that were being retained, uh, third graders that were being retained because of those low reading scores. So that was something that I was very um, happy to see. I have a mobile literacy um, uh, program here in the district too. So that, that bill was very important to me. So we'll start seeing that um, a hard copy book which should be delivered monthly to uh, uh, eligible students uh, throughout all 67 counties. Um, HB 419 was an early learning and early grade success uh, bill that passed. Um, it revises the governance and accountability for uh, uh, early learning programs that are implemented through the Office of Early Learning. Um, and now it'll move the statewide governance of these programs on um, where they were uh, deemed um, and, and set up under the Office of Early Learning to the Department of Education now. So there's been a shift as far as uh, who oversights, who oversees. Um, and this is everything that includes uh, for, uh, voluntary pre-kindergarten education, better known as VPK, and school readiness programs with the State Board of Education. Um, it'll also, this same bill uh, requires the Commissioner of Education, if you don't know who that is now, Google him, his name is Richard Corcoran and uh, to design and implement starting with the 2022-23 um, school year. So I uh, employ everyone on, uh, on the Zoom, everyone listening tonight um, to just please be vigilant and, and make sure we know the folks who have these types of responsibilities and crafting um, you know, the, next, what the next 10, 20 years look like. 
Representative Brown and I and Senator Bracey, we are, um, are parents of young children who are, are at some point will be um, in the pu public school system. So these um, topics are very um, important for us. So um, with that, do would you like us to talk about some of the individual bills that we had briefly? Or and yes. And also just really quick, yes. just to add to that, with that early learning bill, this has been a very controversial issue uh, as it relates to how do we uh, grade our VPK students or our kids in uh, our early learning system. You know, within our Pine Hills community, definitely you see at least 20 per block of VPK or nursery programs. Okay. And so that has always been an issue as to whether or not many of those students that are there are leaving to be ready and prepared for kindergarten. So it's been a, a, a pretty controversial issue. And, and, and mainly in the beginning is how you do, how do you screen, but also how do you really put standards in for a three-year-old, four-year-old, uh, or even a five-year-old, why are they testing at such young, um, young ages? But I think it's important that we, uh, you know, as community leaders and and, uh, and parents really kind of pay attention to what, how this thing will be crafted because it'll start the 2022-2023 year um, as to what those standards are uh, and how they will be testing. Um, but it's, it's, it's very important that we pay attention to that and, and see how we need to move forward with really using our voice to protect our babies. Senator Bracey, we in about, Senator Bracey, you, you want to say anything else or you want to go back into your individual bills? This is good information uh, so far. Yeah, no, it, it, it was, um, I, I think that we've all covered it. So, I mean, there were, there were a couple of other bills that definitely um, were highlighted this year. I'm sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> pull it up. Um, yeah, no, well, there was a ban on transgender women, girls from playing women's sports. Uh, that was very controversial um, since we're on the education uh, portion. So I, I thought that was worth mentioning. That, that took up a lot of time in Tallahassee debating that. Very controversial. But, um, and it was partisan issue. But uh, I'll just throw that in the mix also. But, but I can start on, if we got a couple minutes, I'll just yes. talk about a couple of bills that I sponsored one that's probably gained the most attention is the Randolph Bracey Okoe Scholarship Program. I'm proud of that. Uh, it is it is in uh, direct response to the Okoe Massacre of 1920. So last year I was able to pass a bill that will require schools across the state to teach about the Okoe Massacre, and that will start this fall. So this year uh, we have some call it reparations, what have you, but um, it is compensation to the descendants of the Okoe Massacre. So if you are a direct descendant of the Okoe Massacre, you will be eligible for a $6,100 scholarship from the state. But also, this is interesting in that if the descendants don't take advantage of that scholarship, if they're not enough, let's say, then Okoe African-American students whether they were a descendant or not of the massacre, can also apply and take advantage of this scholarship. This scholarship will go on in perpetuity, uh, indefinitely. Um, it's similar to the Rosewood Scholarship in that Rosewood was passed in 1992 and it's still been going on for 30 years. And so I expect this, this scholarship program to go on uh, well into the future. And so very proud of that. And I think it's uh, it, it, to consider that the only state legislature, the only uh, reparations bill that has ever passed a, legis a state legislature was Rosewood 30 years ago. And this is the second in the entire country. And so really glad to have uh, been the sponsor of that. And um, thankful to Rep Brown also helping on, on the House side also. Um, we also passed a $30 million uh, appropriation for African-American museums. So this was something that uh, myself and the Senate president put together. I wrote the criteria for uh, who can apply. And I, and I think this is interesting because um, 
even so it, it will be for the purpose of refurbishing uh, an African-American museum if there's one in existence, but also for those who want to start a, an African-American museum, they can apply to the state for these funds and can receive up to $500,000. Now, if they get a matching grant, let's say they get another $500,000 from like the city of Orlando or something, then they can get up to a million from the state. Um, and, and so this is another unprecedented um, group of monies that would be directly uh, dedicated to African-American history. And so uh, I, I, I'm very proud of that. And then, as I mentioned before, I was the Senate sponsor of the police reform package. We, we have never passed the police reform package uh, in the legislature. And so this is another unprecedented law that was passed and, and, and I was happy to be a part of it. And I'll, I'll pass it along to Brett Brown. Okay. Uh, and so um, my focus this year was healthcare and sort of health disparities. Uh, I sit, just real brief, I sit on uh, the Healthcare Appropriations Committee, the Commerce Committee, Insurance and Banking, Tourism Infrastructure and Energy Subcommittee, Rules Committee, and then I was also placed on the uh, Select Committee on Gaming. Um, and so, you know, by sitting on the appropriations, uh, the Healthcare Appropriations Subcommittee as rank ranking member, my priority dealt with uh, moms. Uh, I had the opportunity this year to sponsor a postpartum Medicaid bill, which would extend uh, Medicaid benefit from 60 days till 12 months for our moms. As some of you on this call know, I am a new mom to a now 10 month old son. Yes. Yes. Um, had had my baby during COVID. And so I saw the importance of, uh, of healthcare, but also access. Uh, and so it just kind of made me want to push a little harder. Uh, with making sure uh, my advocacy spoke, but also we were able to do something for our moms during this time. And so with that uh, postpartum Medicaid bill um, and, and uh, what they end up doing was the, the speaker wanted to do something to help black moms as uh, we've kind of heard with many of these talking points of black moms, there are healthcare disparities within uh, <coughs> maternal health. And so black moms are three to four times more likely to die than white women or any other race. And so with 45% of our births um, happening on Medicaid, it was important uh, to really uh, pass this piece of legislation. And so I am just grateful for the speaker and his support in this legislation with also helping me get the $239 million allocated and putting wow. pressure on the Senate to really wow. do something to protect our babies and our moms. Um, and so we were able to do that. It's just a, a one step. It's a huge step in the right direction. Um, there is more to, to come as it relates to this maternal mortality crisis, but that bill will definitely be able to impact uh, many of our women who are, um, child, you know, carrying babies, but also giving them the health care benefits they need to take care of that child once they go home, but even up to a year after. Uh, we also had the opportunity to sponsor or establish a telehealth program. You know, for the past several years, we've kind of heard telehealth, telehealth, telehealth. Uh, and, and many of us had the opportunity to uh, participate in many telehealth appointments during COVID. However, there has never been established a maternal telehealth program. Um, and, you know, those with the, the, the Orange County Health Department actually shut its doors and were unable to provide health care to their moms. And so uh, I was successful in getting a pilot, uh, establishing a telehealth program, but also a pilot program that provides uh, money here in Orange County, but also the other pilot will be in Jacksonville. And what this would do is provide toolkits. If we're if we're trying to save lives, uh, many of these women, you know, they need the tools they uh, to take care of themselves at home. And so it is a collective partnership where we were able to get Healthy Start to participate. 
uh, and also expand their reach as well. We were able to get uh, within their budget 63, which typically it was a significant, it was like, I believe like a, a $40 million increase for Healthy Start, but they, you know, were able to bring home 63 million plus dollars to our Healthy Start uh, budget for them to be able to carry initiatives around the state. Um, I mentioned um, health disparities uh, just within many of our minority communities, whether you're Black, Hispanic, Asian, uh, there are a lot of issues relating to hypertension, uh, maternal mortality, lupus, sickle cell, you name it. Our community is, is really affected by many of these uh, things. However, there has not really uh, an investment that has been made uh, in that lately. And so I sponsored House Bill 183, which sort of restructures the Office of Minority Health. Office of Minority Health has been around for years, let's say about 20 years, uh, to really focus on educating and providing grants to local communities to really deal with the health disparities that are going on uh, within our communities. And so it uh, created, like I said, uh, restructured them. It provides more uh, FTEs for the Office of Minority Health. It also requires them to gather data, but also place data, the data that they've gathered on many of these um, disparities or diseases, uh, place that information on their website. It also requires them to the resources that we're having and what we have in Tallahassee, it's been sitting there. So it will require them to educate and disseminate that information in booklets, uh, but also, like I said, on their website on grants that are available. Uh, because a lot of times, most of this money is, again, word of mouth. You may have two or three counties that are receiving funds. Uh, we also put additional money. Each year, they typically will receive two to three million. Let's say 20 years ago, they were up in the upwards of 11 and 13. But this year, we were able to uh, put in their budget nine million plus dollars to really deal with this. But also um, what's significant is it is it establishes a minority health liaison in each of our 67 counties, which is big. Uh, that minority health um, liaison will be responsible for getting within our communities to provide them the information and resources that we have as it relates to health from the state. It also requires that the Office of Minority Health to uh, work with our federal um, with our federal government to make sure we pull down all of the dollars that we are eligible for to really help move the needle on many of our health disparities. Just to kind of highlight on some local projects, uh, we reestablished the Florida Center for Nursing, which will help uh, which, with our shortage. We were able to bring in $800,000 uh, for them to provide training, uh, but also re uh, to help with these shortages within our hospitals and, and in our healthcare system. Uh, the Apopka Fire Station, um, those that uh, are on here that may live in the Okoe or Apopka area, uh, um, you know, with that new area that's being developed, there is not access to fire uh, and there is a fire station that sits right there at that new Advent Health uh, facility because it doesn't have a home. They have a trailer right there and beh right behind the hospital. And um, Senator Bracey and I were able to finally bring home money so that we were able to build this, uh, this fire station and get them out of a trailer that they've been in for a couple years. And they have them in that trailer because again, it, it uh, you have so many homes yeah. that are mm -hmm. uh, built within that area, and it helps with reducing the 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 call time. Instead of twenty minutes or you know twelve minutes for them to get to a fire, they are able to kind of get to it in a short matter of time. So we're happy that a new fire station will be established uh, within that area, so that we are able to provide additional safety uh, for uh, our families, but also their assets. Um, and we'll, I'll kind of touch bases on this, but again, I'm going to ask Allison again, Allison with uh, Equal Ground. She is able to, because we did not get a chance to talk about it, we're running short, of course, but the voter suppression bill. 
Uh, we all have heard about that particular bill, which was a very unnecessary bill, but it limits the amount of um, early voting times, but also our ballot boxes. Uh, it has, has created undue um, burdens for our supervisor of elections office. They're no longer able to uh, use outside funds uh, to help with our voting process here in the Orange County area, but also throughout our counties. And um, it would also, like I said, limit those vote boxes of you just dropping your ballot off. It is now um, a bill that we have seen in I believe now 37, probably 38 states uh, where they are looking to disenfranchise votes um, and um, create this new Trump order uh, to again, still elections in my opinion, but definitely uh, voter suppression. This has been great information. You have done a great job here. I think yeah. uh, Rep. McCurdy has okay. uh, just a few bills that he wants to kind of highlight as well. Yes, ma'am. I'm really close on, short on time. I'll just, I'll be very brief. No, go ahead on because they, uh, we're yeah. engaged. Well, Representative Travars McCurdy filed uh, some, I passed one bill as a freshman this year, HB 467, um, which uh, dealt with insurance, insurance adjuster examination requirements, making it easier for certain insurance adjusters to um, go ahead and get out in the field working because uh, some of their instructional um, activity can constitute for, uh, um, you know, for some of the, um, what was deemed uh, as examination requirements in the past because some of that red tape for insurance adjusters. Um, there was a young lady who brought that to, um, from Tampa, who brought that idea to one of the members and um, I co-sponsored that bill with him, so that passed. Um, House Bill 505. Um, was entitled Minimum Qualifications for Law Enforcement Officers or Correctional Officers. Um, that was one of the many um, criminal justice reform bills that I filed separately that although it did not pass um, on its own, it was a part of the, uh, the larger Crim J reform package uh, that uh, Senator Bracey had mentioned earlier. So there were a number of um, House members on the House side that our bills were compiled into one large um, Crim J reform package. Um, and not everybody had a bill that made it. So I'm happy to see that this minimum qualifications piece made it to kind of make sure that all 67 counties, no matter where you are, um, if you are a law enforcement or correctional officer, you're following and abiding by the same um, threshold and you have the same um, floor and in, in qual uh, qualif qualifications and minimum standards that you all should be following. So it's a uniform, um, some, a uniform policy for all 67 counties. Um, finally, Probably my most um, my my most popular bill was House Bill 185, um, which initially was uh, to make Juneteenth the state pay holiday. I believe okay. um, Senator Bracey was my Senate sponsor, was the Senate sponsor for this bill. We believe that Washington D.C. was looking at us because we couldn't get it passed here, uh, seriously, and, um, and and they made it and they got it to be a federal holiday. Now, I do plan to, it's not over, I do plan to return back um, session. We start committee weeks back in, um, in September. Session starts in January. So I will um, refile a version of this bill because as we saw back in the, you know, when Martin Luther King um, became a, a federal holiday, um, not all states implemented it immediately uh, to make sure that uh, state, um, state employees were being paid as well. So I'll be filing this bill um, along with Senator Bracey in the Senate to make sure that um, while it is recognized as a federal pay holiday now that our state employees um, here in the state of Florida are um, will be compensated as well. So, um, and then the 1.5, I won't list the projects individually, but I was able to secure $1.5 million in the state budget as a freshman um, representative. So I'm very excited about that. And um, that, that's, I'll stop there for any questions in the, in the, the audience may have. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, good information. I know y'all did a, a, a lot more than what you talk about, but you gave some a very good points here. So this is how we're going to do the, the question and answer. There's uh, several of you here on the line. I know many of you have questions. So please raise your hand so I can recognize hands, and then we'll do it in that way. Uh, I'm giving you, if you have a question, you ask your question, and let the next person ask a question before you come back to another question to so give everybody an opportunity to, to get a chance to speak and, and ask questions. 
So I'm going to start off with two questions. Uh, thank you for coming. For those that's here on the line for the first time, there's several senators and Florida representative in Tallahassee. These three people is on our call tonight because they represent the Pine Hills area in addition to other areas. So we want them to come to speak to the Pine Hills residents because they represent the Pine Hills area. So uh, the most popular question that I've been getting, not just today, but every day, all year long, insurance in Pine Hills. The three to eight of, thank you, uh, uh, McCurdy, for mentioning about the insurance. But the auto insurance in 32808 and 32818 uh, uh, seems to be a lot higher than other areas. So if you could help us out in addressing about what can be done, or is, is there any data that shows proof to that? And how can we move forward from being paid higher insurance, homeowners insurance? The other thing is about um, the SEPTA tank. Is there anything in the works at the state level to help Pine Hills along the line of Pine Hills Road moving from septic, the real septic tank? Yeah, moving from, from septic tank to uh, tap into the water management area. So those are my two questions uh, that have been asked all the time. Could anyone y'all address those questions, please? Well, I'll start with the insurance. Um, there was a, that, was debated it was it was negotiated between trial lawyers and roofers and uh insurance folks to try to bring down the cost of insurance and for years there has never been a, we've never been able to get a bill that we've actually been able to pass because um you know a lot of people say because of the the lawsuits um from claims and such and it has it, it has raised the prices of insurance and so we had a bill that we finally got through the legislature but the governor just vetoed it and so uh we're back at square one but i think that bill would have made a dent in reducing those uh insurance costs so uh, i'm well aware of it I talked to many insurance uh, executives and, and just people that have their own insurance business. Some people know Mr. Pat Gray. I talk to him about this all the time. And so uh, we've tried to address it in the legislature, uh, but there is disagreement on how we best tackle that problem. But I, I really thought that the bill that we had this year would have, would have uh, made an impact on that. Thank you for answering that question. So what about the other one? Uh, about getting so, so yeah, so there is, I know we, and this is another issue that we've kind of been working on. Um, as you know, we've done several town halls um, on this particular issue, but also just the outcry to the legislature that something has to be done. Um, as you know, that our area is a priority area uh, due to just past legislation that then Representative Brummer um, sponsor to have everyone to convert to a special tank, uh, but that special tank is super duper expensive. Yes, yes. Uh, but also it causes different problems. So um, as we look at uh, again trying to kind of clean up the environment, clean up the clean up Lake Apopka, many of these other areas. Uh, this year, just with the additional monies that we received from the American a rescue act, uh, we were able to uh, include a huge lump sum of money. Um, and I forgot the amount, but it's a, a huge amount to where uh, counties, uh, it's an infrastructure grant uh, where counties can uh, apply for monies um, to do um, conversions such as the one you're referring to with the septic to sewer. Uh, it is a conversation that I've asked to have with the county. I mean, I've spoken with some of your council members on the side uh, because what we have seen is the, I know that uh, Commissioner Christine Moore, uh, a couple years back, not last year, was it last year? 
I think it was last yeah. session. It was last session. She applied or the she had the county apply for a grant to do a conversion, but she only did one particular community versus making it a broader area, basically where the necessity is. Um, and so I think she has uh, come back this particular year in the county again, applied for that same grant, but again, for that same small community, but again, not for the bigger piece. Uh, and so it's gonna be important as a community council to petition or have the conversation with local leaders to apply for the grant. Cause okay. right now there's enough money but there are not enough people or counties or communities applying for that, for that pot of money. But they can apply for that money and if they do, they will receive it. But it's nothing that I can do. It's nothing that uh, you know, our community leaders could do, but our local government can apply for that particular money. What I can do is I'll follow up with you on that because it was actually placed in the budget. And I'll give you the name of that particular fund. Thank you. Uh, for you all to follow up uh, on that particular grant, but it's an infrastructure grant. Right. For you all to kind of uh, look at working, um, working on this particular issue because it's long overdue. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Raise your hand. Did I mute all these calls so everyone's just listening? And while we are waiting on some questions, I guess. Uh, we forgot to mention, forgive us, some of the tax holidays that came out of the tax package. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I know there are some people waiting um, for our uh, tax holidays, but we have, um, currently we have one going on and it was the Freedom Week. If you've kind of looked on uh, my Instagram, my Facebook, we kind of put that out there, but it was from July 1st to the 7th. So like on camping supplies, fishing supplies, any outdoors, any admission to museums, parks, festivals, all these were tax-free boating and water activity supplies, also sports equipment. So that was one um, tax holiday that we have passed, but also our back to school holiday. So we have our back to school sales tax holiday this week, I mean, uh, this year, it'll be actually a whole week. Uh, the past couple years, you know, just due to, you know, available funding, we've only done, let's say a weekend, uh, before it was two weeks, but this year we did it for a whole week. We brought it back for a whole week and it will be on most of your school supplies selling for $15 or less. It will be on clothing, footwear, and accessories that are selling at $60 or less. And then the first thousand dollars of the sales price of computers and accessories. So if any of our college students or any of our uh, school students, but mainly our college students, because I think OCPS provides computers, but any of our college students that are going back, that first thousand dollars that you use uh, to purchase those computers, your apples, I don't know why <laughs> these kids need these Apple computers, but the first thousand dollars will be tax free. If no one else have a question, I have a question. Does anyone have a question? Did I see a hand? So I have a question. Uh, okay, Dr. Nichols has a question. Go ahead, Dr. Nichols. Take myself off mute. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. This this question is for Representative um, Camille Brown and. You, you um, actually kind of touched on it earlier. My question relates to early learning and literacy. How are we addressing early learning and literacy related to the screening? I know you mentioned a couple of things that were in the works. What specifically, I know that we're going into 2021, 2022, and we know our students have been primarily in and out due to COVID and uh, the pandemic. How do we get those kids caught up without screening and assessments, et cetera? I, I know that that's probably in the plans, but what are we looking at? Uh, and so 
again, the what the legislature has put in is the early learning and early grade success program that we talked about earlier. Uh, I will also talk about just uh, with, there was a bill that kind of looked at school choice, uh, which kind of expanded the choose school choice scholarship program. It didn't again benefit any of our, our, our public school students, uh, but it expanded that uh, scholarship program to cover uh, literacy scholarships. So like reading scholarships, um, let me see, I have it here in my notes somewhere on what, what that expanded to. Okay, here we go. So it's the school choice voucher uh, that uh, now allows you to have or families to have funding for services such as speech pathology for their, if there are any summer education programs. Um, there is also, you're able to use that money for a college prep uh, the Stanley G. Tate Florida College Prep uh, program, um, after school education programs that are established in communities. Um, the VPK School Readiness is now able to utilize uh, funding for that if you look to uh, take your child to another uh, VPK or school readiness program, but also even music um, and therapy. Uh, what that bill also did was it repealed the scholarship for the Gardner scholarship and the um, McKay scholarship. Many of our students with disabilities uh, utilize those scholarships, but now it puts them in the pot with everyone um, else. It also uh, increased the federal poverty level. Uh, uh, it was like a 75% increase. So it's now 375% of the household income. So you're talking about for families that make roughly about a $100,000, uh, they are now eligible to utilize these uh, scholarships. There, uh, Representative McCurdy mentioned it earlier. There is, and that program was through the Urban League that assisted parents. Um, and I believe that is still there. It's a reading scholarship and that reading scholarship was, I believe, about $500. Uh, and that was through the Department of Education that uh, parents were able to get this $500, take it to a tutoring facility or, or use this particular $500 to help with their children coming to grade level. Um, and so those right now are the, the, the projects that the state has from that perspective. Um, I would look forward to seeing what specifically our school districts will be doing uh, the school year. Uh, I have not personally sat down with them um, on that uh, and how they plan on rolling out a program to help. Uh, I know they are, have been in, in contact with the Department of Education, but uh, you know these were just particularly the things that you know we worked on. Um, the Office of Early Learning, which um, he mentioned will kind of go away, has also been working on, and I believe this was a bill we did last year, uh, working on making sure we put in standards to those that are receiving, um, you know, county money that's used for our early learning programs. Um, because right now, as I mentioned, that there are a lot of issues uh, with many of the VPK programs within the Pine Hills community, yes. uh, but we definitely needed to put in more standards and making sure, uh, you know, many of these mm -hmm. organizations mm -hmm. are educate, actually educating the kids versus babysitting them. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Hey, Appreciate can I that. Add, I can yes. add uh, to that. Yes, um, sir. What are, what are we doing? I think um, the, the legislature as a whole, what they did this past session with omitting the test scores is uh, a sign that uh, the legislature is concerned and showing good faith and don't want to put any um, unnecessary constraints on children um, and families as well with having these uh, test scores count against them because kids were doing virtual learning opposed to being in a brick and mortar um, setting. So I think that's already something that we've already done. You asked what we uh, plan to do. So I, of course, uh, like Representative Brown mentioned, there's much more that we can do. But I think that was something that was very important because initially that wasn't a guarantee that those tests, uh, those FSA test scores were not going to count for this uh, for this past school year. That this year. So I think that's something that's very important to mention. 
I've got a question. If no one else has a question, anyone has a question? I've got two more. I don't see a hand. I have two more questions. Um, Representative McCurdy, you mentioned earlier about a, a book of the month. How does a, a student qualify or find out about receiving these book of the month? Then my second question is, you, uh, we talked a lot about grant dollars. How does a local organization, a nonprofit organization, or a, a, a local community organization submit a request for some of these grant dollars that's available to these local organizations? What's the process? I'll answer the easy question first. Okay. <laughs> when it comes to the home book delivery, which was House Bill 3, um, it created a new world reading initiative. So every child in the state of Florida will not necessarily get a book. And this is only for uh, elementary school students who are reading below grade level. So these students are already identified as the school and the school districts will relay that information to the Department of Education and it will be, uh, be identified that way. And so those children uh, will specifically be enrolled in this program in this initiative, and they will receive the um, books um, delivered to their home, one, one, uh, one book per month. When it comes to appropriations, what we call it in the legislature, because the state doesn't necessarily uh, hand out grants um, to, you know, to individuals. So we deal with appropriations. Uh, the grant process is a, is a totally separate process within itself. Um, and the legislative appropriation project, which is um, in layman term, is is literally is just the state budget. So we you know, have the state budget uh, work to pass a balanced budget. That's one of the three um, components that we are sworn to do as as members of the legislature. So um, have a conversation number one with the area members who represent you in the respective um, chambers in the House and the Senate. Number one. Number two. Uh, understand that the, uh, what you're asking for, um, make sure that you have all your supporting documentation, um, do your research, and just uh, realize there are certain things that the state, what's very important when it comes to asking the state for money is what's going to be the state's return on investment. The state, just because they're, you know, they're a state and they have this large part of money, they're not just going to, um, you know, it's not, that's not just writing blank checks. So they really um, have uh, certain criteria. Um, certain provisions that, that really matter when it comes to these projects. But you have every right to have that one-on-one um, -on -one conversation with um, our offices, our staff who can um, better educate you on this process. And then when it comes down to something that is agreed upon and that's worth um, sponsoring, um, you'll just, you, you need a Senate and a House sponsor. You have Senate and House members on this call tonight. Um, and it's just like a bill, we'll work it. And um, depending on where it is and um, um, where it falls on that um, member's priority list, we have to work it through the process. Nothing's guaranteed um, okay. the tournament application, um, just like the rest of the 159 other members in the legislature who's, who are trying to bring money home to their districts too. Um, but I encourage everyone to um, have, a, you have to, everything starts with a conversation. So um, although we travel the same roads and we represent a lot, a lot of the same constituency, um, we won't necessarily know that it's a it's a it's a detrimental problem with the septic to sewer conversion unless y'all tell us. Um, there's not we don't ride around and see you know everything and just because we're elected officials we don't know. So everything starts with uh, a conversation. We're not there to represent ourselves as individuals. We're there to represent the people. You know, close to ninety thousand people in my district. Um, and 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 you know, respectfully, uh, Representative Brown and Senator Bracey, we're there to represent the people. So we have to talk and hear from the people. And, and, and also just to kind of piggyback uh, on what Representative McCurdy speaks on, um, again, it, it has to be an established organization, but also one who, uh, you know, now they're requiring for you to have matching dollars. So, you know, it can't be a new organization that has nothing, no footing to say, hey, I want money. It has to be uh, something that the local government is investing in. Uh, with many of our after school programs, for instance, uh, Senator Bracey and I were able to bring home money um, and we've been able to do it each year with Tech Sassy Girls or the Special Hearts yeah. Fund. Yeah. With uh, and, and we know that is a phenomenal program, but unless there is a match or another investment, a lot of times uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have a, a, a issue with the process, but if you have a governor that sits with a pen to, uh, to, to veto 
uh, those, those issues. We, we felt we needed with True Health, a, a COVID-19 infusion center uh, was able to get, they needed 250,000 to really help some of our hospitals and create an infusion center to where folks don't necessarily have to go back and forth or stay in a hospital to get treated. They were able to get treated at an outpatient facility. Well, that money was put in the, in the budget, but again, just due to it not having, uh, you know, other additional monies that would uh, support it, such as, you know, uh, the Orange County or any of our hospitals didn't put the other 250 up, they canceled out that, that particular uh, funding. And then also just with, the, with some of the grants, there are grant programs, but those are not done through us or the legislature. Those are done through the various department agencies. So you're able to contact the Department of Economic Opportunity if you do work within there. You have the Department of Juvenile Justice. If you do, you know, you work with youth or you have, uh, you know, various programs that really can kind of help within that juvenile justice area, you're able to reach out directly to uh, the, our community or our local DJJ folks to figure out, you know, okay. how do you become a vendor or how do you apply for certain grants or, or, or different things. Same thing with Department of Children and Families. Uh, Office of Elder Affairs. Um, Department of State is another big one for cultural. Department of State has a ton of grants. Uh, but again, there are certain eligibility requirements and contact that you'll have to make with them versus us. And speaking of, of, of that, um, we want to invite you all. I'm, I'm not sure how your schedule is, but early on, we mentioned about the uh, Pine Hills Community Council has partnered with the state realtors realtors, and participating in cleanup waterways. And so we will have a big event July 24th. Mark on your calendar if you're available to come out. We will be at Barnett Park. We will be picking up along Barnett Park Trail and Barnett Park Lake. And this is a, a state initiative that's put on by the Florida Realtors. We would love to have you to come out, reach out to me, let me know yay or nay. Your, uh, your aid has been very helpful. All of the aides has been very helpful in staying in contact with us, uh, with the council. So let us know if you could be there to do the opening or say hello and, and, uh, and greet your constituents. So are there any more questions? This has been a great session. I have enjoyed it. And I hope those that have been listening has enjoyed it. Good information. So are there any more questions? This has been a quiet group. <laughs> Well, I want to just take the time to say hello and thank you all thank you for all. being on the call. Uh, and then thank you all for being a part of the Pine Hills Community Council. I see some new faces, uh, you know, with the council, just, you know, are you, let's say what are you, but prior to COVID, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to kind of come in and out, but it's just been great to see, you know, uh, you all grow. And um, I see you have, let's say new leadership. Uh, hello to Ms. Fatme. Um, who is no longer the president. I believe this is your second year, uh, Ms. Pat. So I want to yes, say Ms. thank Pat. you for all the work you do. Um, and, and, and many of you, Ms. Bush, your husband, so many of you all that really uh, present a strong representation for Pine Hills. It's needed. Uh, you are seen. We see you. We hear you. And I want to just say thank you for all that you do. And I thank you for allowing me to serve you in the Florida House. And this is what the council is doing, uh, what does. If this is your first time tuning in to our uh, virtual uh, uh, monthly meeting, if you're here Facebook Live, you're here on Zoom, become a member of the council. We invest our time, we invest our energy. We are speaking on behalf of what you're interested in happening in your community. So if you're part of a neighborhood association, an HOA, an agency, plug into the Pine Hills Community Council. Go to our Facebook page, go to our website. We are info at Pine Hills, uh, pinehills.info. We have a website. We would love to have you a part of the council because what affect your community or your neighborhood also affect another neighborhood in the Pine Hills area. And, uh, and that's why I participate in other agencies such as the Lockhart Association. What's going on in Lockhart is going to also affect Pine Hills. We're just neighbors, so we cannot do this by ourselves. We have to team up. We have agencies here, so thank you very much. 
I could go on, but thanks for one thing, Dr. Itler. Uh, um, he's on here. Dr. Itler is a board member of the council and Dr. Itler is the uh, chairman of the Greater Haitian American Chamber of Commerce. Dr. Itler, tell them quickly what's going on on Thursday night. Thank you, Dr. Itler. Yes, ma'am, thank you. <clears throat> Yes, in light of the uh, assassination that happened over in Haiti uh, last week or week today, uh, we, uh, the board, in collaboration with Orange County Commissioner uh, Victor Sippen, will be hosting a vigil on the 15th at 6 to 7, an opportunity to show solidarity, but also to uh, strengthen and bring awareness more to, to our community, give them a platform to come in and share their, 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 their grief, if you will, because as Haitian descent, we are hurt. Uh, even those of us that are living here, uh, away from the uh, main uh, issue, we want to stand in solidarity with them. So thank you. If you're able to participate, if you're able to attend, please come and support. And and where, where would that be? That is Thursday. Hello? That's that's Thursday night at Barnett Park. It starts at 6 starts at six to thir six o'clock. Whenever you were watching today, what were you watching it on? What app? Oh, oh, um, um, to be. Uh, what? Let me. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I have a question. How can we reach our representatives and our senator? What's the best way to reach our offices or your aides if we want to follow up on some of the things that you all talk to us about? I've already put my information in the chat. I see Representative Brown has his will, so I'm sure Senator Bracey will follow. Um, and while I have the floor, thank you all just for having us tonight. I also have an event coming up on August the 7th for Back to School. Um, it's not for students, uh, doing something uh, different with a little twist, and it's for teachers, calling it the Teacher's Lounge. So I put the flyer in the chat, and I'm not sure if y'all can see it, but it's on uh, my social media as well. But um, my information, my office, information is in the chat so thank y'all good night god bless you awesome um, well, and, you know I, we my office is located right there in um the pine hills community it's right there off of silver star road so uh feel free to set up an appointment um again we're available by email by phone mail drop by yeah i i would just also just reiterate the comments of my colleagues it's been an honor and a privilege to represent you all in the Florida legislature. I think we've worked together as a team very well, brought some money home, have some legislative accomplishments. It's not easy uh, being in the minority and actually uh, getting things done. And so uh, I think we've, we've done a good job representing. Um, and, you know, my office is open. I'll put it, my information in the chat, 407-297-2045. Bracy.randolph at flsenate.gov. But again, thank you all for having me. Uh, please reach out if you ever need anything. And uh, thank you so much. I, I will be, this will be my last year in the legislature. Uh, many of you probably know I'm running for Congress to replace Val Demings in the US Congress, but uh, it is an honor to represent you all in the Florida House and the Florida Senate. And I look forward to continue representing you. Thank you. And with, and with that being said, I see Peg is on the line before we close out from Representative Val Demings' office. Peg, do you have any uh, comments from the Representative Val Demings' office? And I want to say quickly, I don't know if maybe it's me or what, but this representative has been very open to me. If there hasn't been a time that I picked up the phone and called Representative McCurdy or Representative Brown and Senator Bracey, and they have not returned my call. So I thank you for... Uh, doing that. Peg, are you there? I am here. Thank you so much, Ms. Romp, and um, greetings, everyone. I'd like to thank all of our representatives that took the time out today to share such valuable information with us. Uh, we are eternally grateful that we continue to serve our various districts, and we look forward to helping. I don't have any updates at this time, but I will put my contact information. If anyone needs any assistance, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Okay, with that being said, we are right at eight o'clock. We covered a lot of grounds today. Thank you again. We'll see you all next month, the first Tuesday of each month. We moved July uh, this month to the second Tuesday because of the holiday. 
But next month in August will be on the first Tuesday. I think that's August the 3rd. Our guest speaker would be uh, Kirk at the Court, Tiffany Moore Russell. You, you will want to join in and find out what's, going, what's new going in at the Kirk at the Court. With all minds are clear, uh, we'll say good night. Go to our, our website, info at pinehills.info, or pinehills.info. Become a member of the council. Let's help move Pine Hills forward in the right direction. Thank you, everybody, and, and have a great night. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.